conservative, I would say. And yet she showed me an article that showed a suggestion that really all drugs should be legalized, not that we want to encourage their use, but that the criminal um, acts that occur because of the addictions and the laws and the way they're turned into crimes was counterproductive. And she was even suggesting that not just marijuana, but it was uh, this article was suggesting that all drugs should be made legal. Now, I just I want to just throw that out for this is part of as academic discussion. You know, where wh- where do you come out on that as somebody who's looked at this a lot? Well, I'm in the Erie County Green Party, and the Green Party, even at the national level, mm-hmm. says that the drug laws should be repealed and that this is not a criminal issue. This is a mental health issue, and it should be treated as a mental health issue uh, under the guise of uh, all health issues. Right. Well, actually, as a social worker, I have always thought that in terms of, first of all, mental health issues means that's all of our issue because we most of us have a broken alert system. We have the fight, flight, freeze going on, which is, a, 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 in, you know, in our DNA, we have that alert system that is the same one that we had as cave people, really. We have it, The all the animals have it, we have it. And so that's a system that's meant to come on when there's a threat. It's not meant to be on all the time, but with our current um, activity level, with trauma, intergenerational effects of trauma, and our very shame-based society, just one way and another, and just the activity level, the pressure that people are under, most people have a broken alert system. And so we have huge addiction rates. I've even seen um, statistics that say up to 80% of people have some kind of an addiction. Yeah, sugar. Well, sugar, Salt. actually, sugar is an extreme addiction, too. Mm-hmm. Yes, they, there's research that shows that sugar is more addictive than anything. I can I wholeheartedly agree with that. Have you seen people in the stores? All of a sudden, you're about to leave, and I was like, mm, should I get these peach rings? Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, especially when they're right at the door, right at, at the, the door. door where you're checking out. Well, pop is liquid candy. Yeah. That's so true. so that's an types of sugar though they're naturally occurring sugars and sugars that are added in processed sugars. So right. I mean I think that if people were to have more home cooked meals they would have more of the naturally occurring sugars especially desserts. Mm-hmm. Well back to health and health care is that one of the things that does get overlooked so much and I'm sure as a young dad that you don't overlook this that our diet that our our diet is so important. Huge. Just, yeah, just mammoth. And in fact, so many things that could be dealt with um, where the, the, the medical, you know, the, the techno chemo medicine people will just give you a pill where it could be um, uh, the intervention could be a change in diet is so much more efficient and so much more healthy and healthful. And yet it doesn't. People, you know, they may not know anything about nutrition, the doctors, because it's not really covered the way the pharmaceuticals are. So those those kinds of interventions don't get don't get suggested. So anyway, I mean, it's certainly back to we need real, really healthy health care, healthful, you know, nutrition first, non-invasive kinds of treatments first. And, and we need the things that will help us. And instead of, you know, certainly criminalizing um, uh, health issues and mental health issues, the addiction rates that we have are, are tied to our current issues as a society that means our mental health issues. I agree with that wholeheartedly. And, I mean, I believe uh, you were talking earlier about the criminal justice uh, system. And mm-hmm. it is extremely racially biased in the way that the laws are enforced and also the way that even in the judicial side of the way that sentences are handed out, it's very racially biased in Erie County and in Buffalo. Right, right. Very much so. Very much so. So, and in fact, it's one of the one of the big things. I know that the Peace Center is having a particular push on. I wonder if if uh, Chuck Culhane is listening. Um, we're certainly working hard on the bail, the bail um, issues, 
the bail industry is huge. And, of course, the, the people who manage that are just all about um, keeping things the way they are. And yet it's obviously very unjust when the biggest deciding factor of whether people are locked up or not is whether they have finan- the, the financial means to get out or not. So there's people who've done heinous, terrible things, but they have access to money such that they can get out, whereas people who are arrested on trivial things will be locked up because they can't afford the bail. Yeah, there is a completely separate system for uh, those who are wealthy. And I mean, even just the fact that 90% of criminal cases across the country are settled, uh, you know, with a guilty plea is uh, kind of troubling because, you know, defense lawyers, they do go to law school and do understand how to, uh, you know, form a proper defense. So how many, what was the percentage you said? 90%. That was back in Only 90 yeah, it was back in 2013 that I saw that specific study, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's continued throughout the years. Well, I can tell you that when I uh, when I lived in northeastern Pennsylvania, and that was 10 years ago, that that there it was like 90 something within a percent or two. Uh, it was like 98.7 and 98.8 or something it was 98.7 who, that were that were. Um, uh, uh, settled with a guilty plea, and it was 98.8 in the Soviet Union versus, oh. era, you know, uh, uh, that was actually also uh, oh, Lackawanna County. This is Talking Peace with the Western New York Peace Center. I'm your host, Vicki Ross, and we're here on the phone with Anthony Bainey, who is talking about, well, we really covered a lot of ground already, talking about medical marijuana, um, and also somewhat on the criminal justice system, et cetera. So, um, so we were just talking about the differential ways that, that, um, that really racially oriented um, problems in the criminal justice system is what we were just most recently talking about. So what, what, what would you see as some solutions to some of that? Yeah, so uh, once again, thank you for having me on. And, uh, you know, Assemblywoman Crystal People Stokes is our local uh, sponsor for a bill called the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act, uh, which would allow for anybody in New York State to cultivate six plants within their home. And it would also allow for uh, sales for adult use, for recreational use. Uh, and it would uh, take away all of the criminal penalties that right now are being enforced in a racially biased way. Uh, so that's one bill that is being... Uh, What's her name again? Oh, Just for the Crystal marijuana. People Stokes. People Stokes? Right. Yeah, yeah Crystal People Stokes. Crystal People Stokes, yeah. All right, Crystal. So that's one bill, and then there's another bill that is specifically for the criminal justice side, which is the Fairness and Equity Act. And that one has a little bit of trouble because the state senator that has sponsored that bill, uh, Daniel Squadron, actually is stepping down this year. So it'll be interesting to see how much progress that gets in the state Senate uh, because the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act still hasn't even been uh, even discussed in any of the committee of the two houses in the state legislature yet. Really? Darn. So, uh, well, I want to I want to really give a shout out to Crystal People Stokes because I think she has just been um, wonderful on so many issues. That really, just a, a person of the people, you know, looking after the people's interests, looking after real justice issues. I know one of the things was she was very instrumental in getting um, the raise the age so that so that sixteen, seventeen year olds. Were, would be treated as juveniles in the criminal justice I, system. I'm surprised that uh, they didn't step in when that, that 15-year-old from Florida uh, got extradited from New York State uh, that, killed, that killed the grandmother, supposedly. Now, I don't know about that. Yeah, there was, a, there was a 15-year-old from Jacksonville, Florida. They said he killed his grandmother and he stole the car and he drove it and got caught at the Peace Bridge. And they, they, he waived his extradition back to Florida. 
but I'm, I was surprised New York State let him go because he was only 15, and they were going to try him as an adult in Florida. Yeah, no, I, I didn't know about that. Well, that is not right. So that uh, that would have been, and that should have been to look something it up on the web and that would have been article. caught, you know, that would have been changed. On the, on the Google. Right. Yeah. Well, what would be interesting in that case would be whether the uh, extradition laws somehow supersede state laws regarding, you know, their own criminal justice system, in this case, New York. I, I don't know. Well, I think, you know, I mean, it was certainly a huge amount of progress for us that we at least got that changed. So that is to the good. It certainly is. But it doesn't mean that we're there yet, you know, in terms of um, other. Well, you know, it's interesting, though, because we were the only ones, uh, New York State and North Carolina, actually, weirdly enough, were the only ones that were treating 16, 17 year olds as adults routinely. So I, I'm a little surprised about this about Florida, but um, but anyway, yeah, it's it's still it's still an area where it obviously it needs some work. You know, I mean, I think that our whole criminal justice system. One of the things that we should be working towards is, you know, we as we say, you know, violence begets violence. And and when Dr. King said, um. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Well, people who are having criminal criminal justice, people who get into trouble in the criminal justice system, criminals, let us say, real criminals. First of all, there's lots of criminals who don't get held accountable at all, and they're mostly at the very high levels. Um, but that in general, there are ways, the ways to treat people who are who are um, committing crimes is is really to help them learn other ways and inspire them to other things. So that's what we see in, you know, say in in the Scandinavian countries and other places that don't have the recidivism problems that we have. So I mean, I just feel like our cr whole criminal justice system is so on the wrong page. Right. You yeah. know, it's very, very. It's obviously it's wrong because it doesn't work. It's ineffective. We have the worst, one of the worst recidivism rates anywhere. It's kind of like I don't, I don't, I don't want to put this in like a more demeaning way. Like, um, it's kind of like disciplinary, dis, discipline, disciplining a dog, so to speak, mm -hmm. in the way that they're approaching this. You know, mm -hmm. when you when you discipline a dog, normally you probably spank him. You know, hit him in the nose a little bit. You know, tell him go into the cage. But when you start leaving him in the cage for extended periods of time, no real contact with other people, the dog gets aggressive. It gets cage aggressive. I, I feel as though that happens like nonstop. It doesn't correct behavior. It actually worsens it. You know, and it, they're not right. learning. They're not expanding themselves. Like the, that's what happens. They they are breeding more hardened criminals. Because now the dog is, or you know, not the dog, but people, you know, they're they're learning more from other people that have done worse things. Well, I I'm so glad you brought up about dogs because I was I, actually I how, I how is Pip by the way? Pip is very good. <laughs> I like so I I I took on a dog that was actually the dog of a friend um, who was a great guy, but he was not a really great pet owner, and he had a massive stroke. Um, so I took his, so I, I took his dog and and his cat, actually both of them. But his dog was very very stressed out, and um and very, uh, just excitable and very aggressive with other dogs and things like that. And so a cup, there were two things that really helped him. And so I think this in in line with what we were talking about in mm -hmm. both ways. One was gave him her her. Um, you know, as opposed to what his what her, the um, previous owner had been giving, you know, some improved nutrition. So one of the things that I hadn't realized, but when I went to replace the food, the pet store, they said, well, we we don't carry that kind and we don't recommend that kind. You know, it, it the, the dog should be getting better nutrition. So Pippi Longstocking started getting some better nutrition and that really helped a lot 
towards calming her down. And the other thing was what I call dog yoga, which really I made it up. But dog it's yoga? Dog mm-hmm. yoga. So it's sort of a, a combination of contact, improv, and 